Ed, uh, the great day has come. Good morning. It's always a joy and a privilege to be in touch with you. As you know, we are very, very grateful for being here uh, with you. It's always an honor for us. And on behalf of everyone of this group, we feel uh, very grateful for the generosity, as you know, uh, this is the right word, the generosity of sharing your precious time with us. Uh, well, you know everything about this program, so <laughs> this makes things easier. Uh, this is a group composed by business and thought leaders of many of Brazil's leading companies and institutions. Um, and you know that most of them are at the sea level uh, and or on boards of directors. And uh, as you know, Ed, uh, we are debating critical issues every month based on a book that is selected to serve to serve as a sort of a framework for um, the discussions. And in the first three editions of this program, Ed, since 2021, you awarded us with the privilege of your presence. And as you also know, uh, in all these years, uh, both your book and the session with you were the best rated according to participants, you know, among all books and interviews that we had. And uh, on top of that, uh, please let me say Ed, that meeting you and being um, able to call you friend has been one of the greatest uh, gifts of this program for me. So, and for Angela as well. So um, you have been such a friend, such a mentor for me in the past few years. And I'd like to publicly uh, recognize this and thank you for this. Um, so today uh, we'll talk about both your widely acclaimed books, Humility is the New Smart, right? This gem here and also, of course, um, hyper learning, which is another one that I like it a lot. Hyper learning here, and also about your newly released book on your work journey, which I had the normal um, privilege of endorsing. So uh, I, I was really I felt honored to be one of the endorsers, public endorsers of this book. So Ed, um, you don't need introductions, uh, but for the sake of starting this event in a more formal way, because we are recording, and I'd like to, to highlight to all participants that Professor Ed Hess is a professor emeritus at the University of Virginia. Um, and um, has uh, spent more than 20 years in the business world uh, before joining the academia, working uh, in Wall Street in many companies, uh, including um, Warburg, Pahiba, Becker, uh, the Robert Press Group, and Arthur Anderson. And uh, in 2007, he joined the faculty of the Darden Business School of the University of Virginia as professor of business administration and the first uh, Batten executive in residence emeritus. He's also a Batten faculty uh, fellow emeritus and Professor Hess has taught in over 20 executive education programs in places in all such as ES in Barcelona, uh, the Indian School of Business, Georgia Tech, and AFT Denmark. Um, he consults regularly with public and private companies and with some federal government agencies. Uh, Professor Hess is the author of 15 books and counting, right? And counting over uh, 140 practitioner articles and over, believe it or not, 60 Darden business cases. And the common theme of his work is high individual and organizational performance. Uh, his book, Smart Growth, was named a top 25 business book in 2010 by Inc. Magazine and was awarded with the Wachovia Award for Research Excellence. Uh, Learn or Die, Hyper Learning, and Humility is the New Smart were also Amazon bestsellers. Uh, his new book, which is this one, once again, uh, On Your Work Journey, uh, he says that is for every person 18 years old or older who wants to have meaningful work and a happy life in the smart technology age and uh, not being left behind um, by the pace of this technological change. Just to conclude, um, Professor Hess' work has appeared in many outlets, you know, such as Harvard Business Review, Fortune Magazine, European Business Review, Fast Company, Forbes, The Washington Post, Financial Times, and in more than 400 
other global media publications, such as uh, CNBC, Fox Business News, uh, Wall Street Journal Radio, Bloomberg Radio, Dow Jones Radio, and so on. Uh, this is just a sample. So, um, Ed, without further ado, I'm going to kick off this conversation uh, with four or five questions, and then open to other questions um, from the members of our group, whom I also greet and thank you very much for, for being here, okay? Good, good. Both okay. speed ahead. Speed ahead. Yeah. So Ed, very short um, question to start off. Why do you believe it is so critical for everyone to want his or her work journey in the smart um, technological age? And what is at stake and what are the benefits it can bring to everyone? Well, clearly we're in a completely different era than we've ever been in because of smart technology and AI. And it's transforming how people are going to work. It's transforming who will work, all right? Uh, technology is going to continually advance. Our, you know, it's not gonna just be AI, it's gonna be smart robots. And so what's happening here is a transformation that we human beings have never experienced before, right? It's a, it's a challenge because the technology, the technology can basically in certain types of cases can think better, faster than we can think, right? The technology doesn't have emotions, so doesn't get emotionally involved in trying to be, you know, better than somebody else. The technology just is all data driven. So we're we're in an era where tech that's going to be very, very volatile. Volatility will be the norm. And so how do we human beings who have not basically been trained to live in heavily volatile areas, unless all right, unless you're uh, a military person that's constantly in warfare, all right, but we haven't been trained. We haven't been able to train our minds, our ego, uh, how we think, how we listen, how we relate, et cetera, in ways that give us the ability to adapt at the speed of change. And it's changing every day. And we're not wired to be highly adaptive learners. We, most of us have never been taught how to be highly adaptive learners. It hasn't been necessary. So it's, it's sort of hard to ex explain it from a word wise. We are, we are engaged now in a work environment, which no matter what the work is, is completely transformed in the next five years no matter where you live in the world. And there's a huge battle on between some large technology companies. There's a huge battle on between China and the United States about technology dominance. And all of this comes down to, you know, whether you live in Brazil, whether you live in India, whether you live in Japan, whether you live in Canada, doesn't matter. It's all there. And it's all happened so fast. And what's so amazing is, is that the way we human beings are wired, all right, we're, we're not wired to be highly adaptive learners. We basically go out into the, you know, in the world seeking confirmation of what we believe. Affirmation. We want pats on the head. All right, uh, we're looking to to you know to be smart winners, etc. But all of that is going to require us to rewire ourselves because the science is 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 crystal 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 clear, and you know we're wired to go out in the world and seek confirmation of what we believe affirmation of our egos and cohesiveness of our stories of how our world works. We emotionally embrace the three Ds, the deny, defend, deflect. So we've got to basically take ownership of ourselves. We've got to develop 
an a quiet ego, a quiet mind, a quiet body. We've got to be a good reflective listener. We've got to be a great critical thinker. On and on and on. And so that's what that's what the books are really all about, that journey to best self, that taking ownership of you. Again, ownership of your ego. Everybody's got an ego. Okay. Your body. All right. You you give people information about you by how you react body wise when you're doing business, right? And also when you're not doing business. And it's the, it's then, how about your emotions? How many of you work on taming your emotions? How many of you work on, if you will, generating positive motion, emotions and managing negative emotions? How many of you have basically ways that you can basically calm yourself immediately? Because the smartest people, the most successful people, are going to end up being people that basically have inner peace that everything inside of them is is quiet it is calm it is open-minded it is respectful because human work going forward is going to be done primarily in teams and the quality of the conversations that are going to take place in the teams is going to de determine the quality of the organization and the quality of the organization's success. So it's like all of a sudden, all of this is here upon us. And so the challenge for leaders is what we, one, the science is overwhelming that everything I've said is correct. It's not Ed Hess talking. It's a lot of brilliant scientists that, that, that have basically spent their lives doing this. How do we basically become highly adaptive learners all right, who can learn, unlearn, and relearn at the pace of technological change. That's the that's the story. And the people that do that the best are going to be the winners. Wow. And Ed, uh, I'd like to dig deeper on this. Um, uh, why do you say that paradoxically, understanding how to generate these you know, positive emotions and managing negative emotions is mission critical in the smart technology age? And in particular, for leadership positions and to be a hyper learner. Why is that so, so important nowadays, paradoxically? Because how we relate to other people is, is mission critical because most work that's non-rote work is going to be basically done in small teams. And so the quality of the conversations in those small teams determine the results. So the quality, so it, it goes back to the, the, the concept of collective intelligence, all right? The, the, the organizations that, that basically have people that come together and have conversations, the right types of conversations, open-minded conversations, respectful conversations, conversations those are going to be the people and again it's all going to be about speed you know say that you know there's a large number of people here say that four of the people here work in industries which are the same all right it's pretty clear to many of us that no matter what industry you're in what business you are in there's going to be significant consolidation over the next five to 10 years of industries. There will only be two to three industries, big industries in each industry model. That's it because of the technology and the speed. So when you're going back to your question, why is this all so Im important? It's, it's the, the biggest differentiator be between technology and human beings is going to be emotions, period, exclamation point, question mark, whatever you want to put there. It's going to be emotions. And so how people emotionally connect with others. The research is overwhelming at MIT and Carnegie Mellon on, um, on this fact, all right? They, they, 
I think uh, Carnegie Mellon did three research projects. MIT did five. Teams of five people, all right? All working on the same problems, all right? Everybody with me? The difference is makeup of the team, okay? Five men, no women. Four men, two. Three men, two women, okay? Two men, three women. You get to drill, all right? And they did these research projects and every research project came out with the same result. What five member team every time excelled at collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. What was the makeup of that team? Well, while all, all of the people I'm looking at of the male persuasion, I will tell you that the research was done by, again, Carnegie Mellon, MIT. It is, it is valid research, okay? The best teams were five women and no men. The second best teams were four women and one man. Third best, three women, you get the gig, don't you? Three women, two men. And it was interesting, I was some years ago in, in, uh, in Seattle and, uh, talking with Microsoft, Amazon leaders, we were, we, we were doing a little a couple of hours together and, we, and I brought this up. And the woman from Microsoft, a very senior, probably the most senior leader there, raised her hand and she says, well, Professor Hess, can I have a question, ask a question? I said, sure, you can ask a question. She says, based on that science, why do we women need men? And, you know, no one ever asked me that question. And I sat back <laughs> and, I, and I thought to myself very quickly, there is no way easy out of this. So I went back to her and I says, well, what do you think? Okay, what do you think? And she says, well, I'm having real trouble with this because I enjoy the people I work with and everything. But I know that women can basically have babies by buying the sperm from the smartest people in, you know, in, in the West Coast, da, 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 da. I, I don't see it. And the red faces in the men lit up the room like it was on fire. And mm -hmm. uh, but it goes down to and it's and I say use this because it's comical. But the fact of the matter is, is that men can be a very men can do this. Men can learn this. It's just that men, generally speaking, have been wired to be more dominant, all right? They're more competitive. Um, they're not em basically into emotions as much unless they're negative emotions to hurt people. So I think that the biggest transformation, the biggest thing going forward is that's going to determine who works to, to determine companies is the emotional state in the organization and building a positive emotional environment which liberates people in order to bring their best self to work. And the people are responsible for being doing the work to become their best self, but the organization's got to have the right environment. And I truly believe, and I think that's going to drive a lot of the uh, shakeouts. Uh, oh gosh, three, four years ago, and I think it was now four years, Four years ago, so I, I wrote an article for CEO World, and I'm not bragging about this at all. I'm just sharing an experience um, where I made the statement that, uh, at least in the United States, um, this was three, four years ago, that by 20, 30, 50 percent of all CEOs in the United States would be women. And that article, you, you thought somebody, I wrote, wrote something that basically said, you know, and by that time period, you will, you will, you will not be living. Okay. Like I was threatening people, but it was, uh, but the fact of the matter is I still believe that I still believe that the science is there. And what I see in the businesses that I'm dealing with, um, and that doesn't mean again, I'm not anti-male. I am a male. All right. I know we can learn how to do this. And when we learn how to do this, we're as good as women. 
but men have bigger egos in a lot of cases than women. And so leaders such as you have got to deal with that. How to basically, you know, you rein in the egotistic men who are basically not going to be your top performers. That's that's very heavy duty stuff, isn't it? I don't I don't wow. mean to be heavy I don't mean to be heavy duty or or whatever, but I'm I'm I feel pretty strongly about how fast this is going to happen from the very very smart people that I am lucky enough to engage with. And so every organization almost has a duty to say, okay, how do we become a highly adaptive learning organization? Question mark. All right, let's get on the gig. Let's join the game. And you know, and you, 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 because humans have got to rewire themselves which means an organization's got to rewire themselves because who's in an organization right now it's mostly humans coming fast is the technology yes wow ed um i have two more questions before opening for other questions from the members of our group so don't be shy everyone okay uh, let's make use of this great opportunity but um ed now I'd like to ask you um, a more, I'd say, personal question, because you start your wonderful new book on your work journey by saying that everything that you recommend in this book is what you have done throughout your life. So um, could you please share with us a little bit of your life story, some of the obstacles you overcame in your life, and what is, was the process that I, I know it's been a long journey, a long journey of personal development that enabled you to do the things that you recommend in your book, you know, such as the idea of being an explorer, to be courageous, you know, to stand up for yourself, to have the courage to ask, to read books, which is unfortunately rare nowadays, and to learn from personal failures, well, and so on. Wow. That's that's a that's a big question. Uh, it's not a big question. It, it's a question that's got a lot of years that take place. Let me let me just think for a second or two and think how I can consolidate it where it's useful for the people that are that are listening. Um, first, I I grew up in a from a, a very humble background. Um, I was, my family was different than, you know, 99% of the people that lived in the community. Um, I was raised in a, a little town in rural Georgia. I mean, if you go really back as to my existence, uh, I was, um, uh, you know, I was born and weighed, you know, two pounds and six ounces and was in an oxygen tent for uh, months and uh, was not expected to live and was the first baby that lived in the in Atlanta, Georgia, at the hospital. They took me to that hospital. And so me, me being alive was, a, was an un, unusual situation. And I was not a good athlete, and I, we lived in a little rural town where athletics was great. And so I was put down, I was made fun of, um, you know, all of that stuff. And uh, my family was made fun of, and et cetera, et cetera. And so how, how did, what did my family do? Uh, we were, my parents were, uh, you know, poor, uh, but my mother would save my mother was from Massachusetts. My father was from Germany. So we were in rural, rural South. Um, but my mother would basically save up money and take, when I was beginning when I was in the first grade and second grade, every two, three months, take me to the bookstore and say, you know, you should get books about people who have been successful. And so I started reading books about people from all walks of life who were successful um, starting in the second, third grade. 
and you know, my life is, I've never stopped reading and trying to figure out, okay, how do these people do this? And so I had my parents supporting me. And then the thing that changed our life was football was king. And um, the, in our little town, our football coach was the number one or number two football coach in the state of Georgia. And after my seventh grade, we went to school in the eighth grade. I got a phone call at the end of the seventh grade and uh, I picked up the phone and he said, is this Ed Hess? I said, yes, this is Ed Hess. He said, this is Coach Grisham. And I dropped the phone, okay, because in that little town, he was God. I picked it up. I said, sorry, I dropped the phone. He says, I, he said, yes, you did. And I, he, he said, how would you like to become an athletic trainer? I said, what's an athletic trainer? He says, I'll teach you to wrap ankles, but I really want you to also to be part of my team to help me with my players. And I said, wow, I, I don't know about that. And he says, well, this is something that would be very good for you. And I know you can do it and I want you to do it. And he said, there's only one thing that I demand. And I says, what's that? He says, I want you to be at my house at 730 every morning. And for the next five years, I want you to ride to school with me. And we, we would always do stuff during the summer. I want you to ride to school with me and then I'll bring you back and so all of a sudden, me and my family became uh, accepted because the most powerful man in the in the in the in the, in the whole county uh, and the state, really football wise, uh, put his hand over my head and said, "You know, leave these people alone. They're they're mine. I'll take care of them." And that led him to uh, teach me how to write articles. Uh, that led to me to getting a full athletic scholarship as an athletic trainer uh, and then as a data analyst uh, in college football, all of that. So what, you know, I came about because of other people. Uh, you know, when I first went to Wall Street, um, um, I practiced law. I went to Wall Street um, eventually. And, you know, and the person who was, hiring me was the senior partner of the law firm I used to work for. And I said, you understand, I don't know anything about, you know, finance. He says, I wouldn't know an IRR if it hit me in the head. He said, I know that. But he said, I know you will know by Saturday how to, how to basically do an IRR. And I know you'll go out there and learn. And so I've had all my life people that have reached out to me and basically uh, for some for some reason, uh, whether they saw something in me or I was so weird, they wanted to figure out what that stuff is. I don't know, but um, in you know it goes on and on. I could go. I mean, uh, you know, I I ended up going to law school instead of going into uh, psychology, which was my love, and I did that because I happened to spend an hour and a half with Robert F. Senator Robert F. Kennedy when he was running for president of the United States just by happenstance. I was standing there and he walked by and he said, hey son, come on, walk with me. And we spent an hour and a half together. Uh, and he went to the University of Virginia Law School. And this all happened in the, sp in the sp spring of, late spring of the year. And you know, and he said, you should go to law school. So I went back and told my parents, I wanna go to law school. And he says, you haven't taken, no, you have, you know nothing, but you, no, you can't do that, you're going to, Psych, uh, psych school. I said, no, I'm not. And so what did I do? I picked up the phone and called the dean at the University of Virginia Law School, which is a top five law school, and ended up speaking with him. And we talked 45 minutes and he says, I'll see you in September. I said, do I need to take the law boards? He says, no. He said, I said, do I need to give you an application? No. He says, I'll see you in September, son. And I mean, so that's how my life evolved. And, and so I've been very fortunate. Um, and I don't, I can't explain to you why all that happened. Uh, although I think probably is that one of the aspects of it is I never was fearful of going into the unknown. I always went into the unknown and, and, and figured that out with other people. I didn't, it was other people who talked. 
they saw something there. So, and that all sounds sort of egotistic in everything, but it's not. Uh, I mean, you know, I have a whole list of people which I basically thank every night before I go to sleep because there's 25 people have been in my life that basically have, you know, gotten me to where I am. Wow. And Ed, well, it's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's a, it's a wonderful journey and I strongly recommend everyone to read the books, um, Ed's books, because it's really inspiring all your you know trajectory and and Ed, my last question here before angela uh, just, just i i just uh wanted to to ask uh, uh professor has or ed to to tell us about this turning point that that you had in your if i may compliment angela because oh, it's about okay. the question that i'm going to make okay okay <laughs> great so because Ed, you know, over the past few years, we have spoken with business leaders uh, who have clearly evolved to become, you know, humble leaders, such as uh, Bob Chapman, you know, the chairman and CEO of Barry Way Miller. We have also a talk with Hubert Jolie, which has been the former CEO of Best Buy. And from these conversations, Ed, it became clear that these uh, individuals had a sort of a turning point or inflection point in their lives that made them revisit uh, their concept, their very concept of success, and let's say on their personal narrative of life, you know, from just of individual achievement to one of a, to a narrative uh, of legacy, of caring, of contribution. And often uh, these turning points, um, you know, that allowed them to evolve, um, uh, involved, I would say, um, some kind of a painful event, sometimes related even to a personal or a health um, uh, event. So do you believe Ed, that becoming a more humane leader depends on a deep reflection and reveal of our life purpose and uh, and of concept concept of success of personal success and uh, and that sometimes it's necessary to face a kind of a strong event to 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 be a catalyzer of that absolutely absolutely uh, I had one of those events all right that basically, rocked my boat or rocked my ship or knocked me on the, I mean, not, not physically knocked me, but it was so, it was so bad. I ended up, in, you know, I was probably 34 years old, 34 years old, laying on the floor and crying like a baby. All right. Um, and so, yeah. And I think that, and that was all around emotions. And uh, because I had gotten to the point where I was a, and this is not ego, this is just showing you how bad it was, okay? I mean, I was an awesome machine, all right? But the fact is, is, you know, I, ha I had a wife, uh, had a daughter, and, uh, you know, one morning I came down to, for breakfast and everything. We were living in Washington, D.C., and I was working in Wall Street and in Washington. And, um, and she said, we need to talk. I said, okay. And she says, you're never here. You're never really here. You're not with us. And this is not working for me. And, um, and I looked at my watch and this is I'm so embarrassing to say this, but it shows you how deep I was gone. I says, I hear you and everything, but I got an important meeting that I need to get to. Can we talk about it tonight? And, you know, and I got up and left. And I got home at night and there was a letter on the table saying, we've moved out. All right. Uh, you get yourself right and then we'll talk about whether we come back. And I said, holy mackerel. All right. And I mean, it's the first time I ever remember crying. Uh, and then the next day I get a call from my brother, who's a big doctor in Florida, and we had basically uh, built a car uh, 
franchise that uh, was basically uh, took cars at two to three years old that people were selling and then reselling. He called me and he said, bro, I got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, we've had an embezzlement. I said, well, all right, so what do we need to do? He says, well, I need $500,000 from you and I'll put in the other 500,000 because they stole a million dollars. So here I was, my wife walks out on me. I got to pay a million dollar loss. And what did I do? I laid on the darn floor and cried like a baby again and said, okay, I got to get help. And so I did a lot of research, found probably the best person that was around um, and went to a psychologist and basically, you know, over the years, she basically helped me understand why I was doing what I was doing and how to become a more emotional person and a kind, caring person. And I never was bad about anybody. I just was, you know, I was just get the job done, get the job done. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I had to go through a transformation and I'm very thankful for the people that helped me do it. Well, thank you so much, Ed. Thank you for sharing with us. More, more than people want to know. More than people, I'm, I am sure this group and everything are going to walk away with this saying, that guy was re really weird. I mean, he had to see, it is impossible for somebody to have that many good stories that basically, you know, transformed him. But no, yes. I was lucky. Yes, and you also almost became the CEO in the, the same week, right? So it was everything right. together. <laughs> That's right. I, I was in the final two for CEO of a company that I really wanted to be a CEO. And, and um, I was, the, we call them in the United States, headhunters, all right? The headhunter called me up and says, let's go to lunch. And I went to lunch and I knew I had been named CEO. And he said, Ed, he said, you're the most qualified one for the job, but I'm not going to recommend you because you're never going to be happy. You're always going to want something bigger and better. And I'm not going to basically, you, you, you will only keep this job two to three years. And I can't do that to my client. And I says, I'll stay longer. He says, Ed, no, you won't because you, you're on a journey. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Angela, please. Well, first, Ed, it's an honor to have you here again for us. It's a great pleasure and it's a joy to listen to you every time. Uh, first, it's a comment, just a comment about the researches that you mentioned about women and men and in, uh, collective intelligence. I always use that in my classes, but I'm not so optimistic uh, like you are uh, about the pace of evolution. <laughs> Uh, of women CEOs because we are not rational thinkers. We are irrational uh, mostly of the time, and um, and our biases they are they 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 choose for us, and uh, we have the the availability heuristic that chooses man, white man, tall man. Uh, mm -hmm. to be uh, CEOs. And <laughs> so uh, we have the human factor that it's in the middle of that. Um, and I, I would like to, to, to make two questions, okay? Um, I'll be um, uh, a little bit shorter than, than Alex that made five. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about uh, the challenge uh, to transcend the duality of the you and me, uh, to always be aware of this, this uh, interbeing, this connectiveness, this, 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 that you just mentioned, this gratitude that you, the, the exercise about gratitude that you mentioned every night that you think about these 25 people and how all, uh, all of you are connected and your story is connected with all of them, but also, all of us. Uh, so, um, how how can we uh, transcend this individualism and to be aware of our more aware of our interbeing and uh, this relationship with humanity, uh, humility? Sorry, this is my first question. 
Do you want to answer first and then my next? Sure. Yeah, sure. okay. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, and it's very, your question is a very important question for everybody that's listening. Um, everybody that's not listening is also important. But, and it's, I think it comes down to, we can, we can manage our emotions, all right? We can learn how to generate positive emotions and we can learn how to, if you will, um, limit and get rid of negative emotions. And so it's, it's, it's that, you know, what's, what's the German, the, 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 the process, all right, which you can generate positive emotions. And we talk about that in the humility book. Uh, I talk about it probably more deeply in the most recent book because it's a workbook. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, um, you know the, the first start is, is you basically got to embrace gratitude. And every every day, every day, make sure that no matter what business you're in or what you're doing, you say to yourself, you know, did I was I gracious to somebody? Did I thank somebody? Did I, you know, um, show appreciation? All right, and that's home life plus work life. And so gratitude practices as as. It's huge, um, and so you start out from there. Then you, then you, then you start out. Okay, what is? How do I feel positive, and how do I come across as positive? How do I behave in ways? All right, and that goes to how do I listen? All right, do I interrupt people? Do I always have to be correct? Uh, do I ask people questions to make sure I understand what they're doing? So it's all evolved in in how we behave. That I think that emotions come up, ultimately come about because of learned behaviors. And we all have to basically change or behave in ways that enable others, all right? In a business, you know, you know there's a lot of competition inside a business. Well, that needs to be basically really toned down a lot because the biggest contribution, biggest um, problem is going to be technology, all right? And technology is smarter than any of us. It's going to be smarter than any of us. And so it's just think about, okay, how do I take ownership of me? How do I take ownership of me? And that's humility. That's mindfulness meditation. Right, and you go down the, the list that you that you know that's talked about in the book. How do I be a good listener? And you work on those things. And the reason you work on those things is you have been accountability partners, right? Um, person that's been named the top ten leadership coach in the world for the last ten years um, happens to be a, a friend and everything, and you know. Years ago, we were talking about this, and here's a top leadership coach, and in, and in fact, last time I talked to him, he still does it every day. He has a person that he hires, a, a coach, so he has a coach who calls him every night and holds him accountable for what his deliberate practices are that they're working on now. And this is a person in his 70s, all right? Every night, he's held accountable. He does deliberate practices. So it's that it's it's a little bit like we human beings are going to have to basically get to the point where we're doing deliberate practices, two or three, not a not a hundred, that we rewire ourselves, that we bring that self to the table and we hold ourselves accountable and we measure. That's the only way people really change. Does that make sense? Have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and Angela, if you could uh, please just take the picture before your question. Um, I think it would be great to make use of the moment yeah. that everyone is here. Yes, let's wait a second. So, um, 
So, Ed, we're going to take a picture to register this moment, okay? Yeah. Very special moment, as usual. So, one, two, three. Okay. Let me see if it's good. Just a second, please. Okay, perfect. Okay. I see we got okay. some hand, we got some hands up. Yeah. Uh my next my next question is um from from your uh of course from your book uh, and your story, your life, uh it, it shows that our external uh, connections they are uh, in businesses, in families, in communities, they reflect our inner connection with ourselves, with our feelings and the acceptance of who we are. Uh, not more, not, not less, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but we have a need, uh, an extreme need for belonging. And I, want to, I wanted to know from you, uh, how does it relate with uh, uh, the, 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 the the humidity and and this this inner connection uh, with um, the inclusion of excluded people historically excluded excluded people in the corporate world uh, like women black people disabled or the ones that have a humble background just to mention you have and myself as as well uh, what are your thoughts about the relation? Uh, relationship with uh, humility, acceptance, and self-acceptance, and belonging of the historical excluded and minority groups. Well, let me let me answer it. Let me answer it and frame it maybe a little differently. If if I'm a leader in a company, what obligation? Do I have to, you know, to um, treat people fairly with dignity, uh, no matter who they are, where they come from, what their background is, or whether they report to me about? And I've got to role model that with the people that report to me, who have to role model that with the people that report to them, who have to role model, and it goes down the, the circle. I think that human dignity. Uh, you know that every every leader or an organization has the duty to treat people appropriately um uh, and the fact is 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 that in order to do that they got to people got to get rid of the big ego people got to be managing their emotions, managing their behaviors, manage how they listen. They got to bring a best self to the table. You bring your best self to the table. It doesn't matter whether it's the person that's sweeping the floor or the person that just figured up, you know, chat GPT-7, all right? It's a human being. A human being is working in your company, a human being that may not report to you, probably scared of you. But the fact is, is that you have the duty anytime you see that human being to acknowledge their existence and to show that you care about them. And then when that scales through an organization, magic happens, magic happens. And so it's a little bit like, you know, we we're going to, we're going to change how we, def senior leaders are going to, are going to broaden the scope of their duties. And part of my duty is to transform this organization and the behaviors in this organization and how we treat each other in this organization. And that's how we're going to be successful. And that's going to be how everybody can make some money. All right. Because it's always about money. All right. But the fact of the matter is it's survival of the fittest and, um, you know, all of the all of the games and everything. It's just not going to work in this new environment. It sort of sounds funny to say that technology is going to drive us to be better people. 
because it's only when everything is coming together and you got respect and dignity and and you know, you still got to do the work. It's all that, but it's it's the emotional state. It's as and and as a as I've told so many companies, the your ability to be a winner in the AI age is highly dependent on the emotional state of what's going on in your company. End of story. And so, working on that emotional state is mission critical. And it starts at the top because you can say it, but if you don't behave it, it's hypocrisy and you're lost forever. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas, please. Oh, mm -hmm. Professor Hess. I was so absorbed in your answers. Some of them very reached me very profoundly. I, I almost forgot what I was going to to ask, <laughs> but uh, I have many questions. I will try two of them. Um, one of them is uh, when I listen to you and uh, what I know from your book, Buddhism seems... Uh, very, very aligned uh, with all you said, from gratitude, humility. Uh, so I, I would like to know how much Buddhism is important or was important in uh, putting everything together and influencing, influencing your behavior. And uh, my second uh, question is more practical and maybe I work in boards and when you speak about small groups that's exactly exactly board board of directors uh, what is your experience with them what is wrong and what is good uh, with the boards they are very important and uh, what would you do to better them two two very good questions um yes um buddhism has been important for me uh and it has basically been the foundation for me personally the foundation building block for me taking ownership of myself and mindfulness meditation you know taming my ego all right um and relating to other people in positive ways um i started meditating quite some time ago and got because i was still in that realm of being successful and getting stuff done and i wasn't you know i wasn't uh seeing any progress and i quit all right and then i had a close friend uh, who's a meditator and said you don't quit so that's just part of the thing and he said you you know and he, he then challenged me in a way that he knew would you know honk me off he says you, you you're sort of turning into a wimp and you know so he was calling me out mail to mail all right and i said i'm gonna start over and so i did start over and um, it's, it's foundational. Mindfulness meditation is foundational. And many, many companies now are using it. Uh, I have companies that basically do a three-minute meditation before every meeting is start, starts, and they do a five-minute meditation at the end of every meeting. Uh, it's meditation. It's, it's, it's foundational. And so... Um, and with the stress and everything that's going on in the technology area and in the world from a political and everything, uh, people that I'm working with are finding, okay, 20 to 30 minutes is not enough. I got to do it twice a day. Um, I, I know people that, that, um, 
meditate in the morning now that we're meditating 20 minutes that are now meditating 60 minutes and i asked them why they said because it takes that amount of time for me to get through the entire day the way i want to behave so mindfulness meditation the science is overwhelming and the science there's lots of sciences that's been in the united states built in the united states uh, from psychology departments and medical departments that has nothing to do with you know which of the great religions is important it has to do with the science and how it transforms what's going on in your mind so med mindfulness meditation is a rewiring tool to basically increase calmness uh and to be uh, and it's the the type of it's the type of thing that changes one's perspective vis-a-vis -vis the ego. Uh, so, all right. So your second, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm an old guy. I forgot your second one. It was I'm, about, the, about boards. the relevance about boards. Oh, boards, yeah. boards. Uh, boards are, boards are an interesting, I mean, that, that's a very interesting question because so many times public companies especially big public companies you know boards boards are there and the ceos don't really want to listen to the boards they know what they want to do they just want the boards to approve so it depends on the, the entity and how it uses the boards and what it wants from the boards all right and in today's world what you want from boards is people that are helping you figure out, all right, or stress test what's going on and how to make it better, all right? Because big companies and even any company, all right, you got a CEO, a leader, you may have a chairman, but you know, they all sort of got their story. And the purpose of boards, especially now, in the digital age, the purpose of boards is to stress test all of those decisions that are important. Otherwise, why are you there? All right, because the technology can tell you what to do. All right, uh, and it's like, so I think boards are, are very important. I have to be honest with you, I think that Boards are way underutilized. And I think that, um, you know, it takes a certain type, it takes senior leaders who have a, a quiet ego, a quiet mind, or a good listeners, and are, you know, et cetera, and have an open mind. It takes a certain type of leaders for boards to optimize the joint performance. Does any of that make sense? So sure. it's a little bit like it's the boards are at the mercy of the leadership and whether the leadership is on the journey to best self in the digital age. If the leadership's not on it, my way or the highway, we've been doing this for years or we know what's going on or we know this, we know that, we just want you to give, me a, give us a check mark, give us a check mark, da, 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 da. You know, it, it depends on the, it depends on the mission. Why do, you know, why do we need, why do we want, why, and I know why we need, because we're a public company, but uh, it's most of them. So I think that that's to be determined, to be determined, and just, and hiring people, boards have gotten to the point where they become, you know, they they want to hire people um, because they're trying to overcome other obstacles. But by hiring those people, what they don't understand is that they've got to give those people the power to change things in their company. It's not just we got ex board members of different diversity of different this. So therefore, we should be a good company. No way. You got to take it all the way down to the bottom and the board people have got to be involved in that. Makes wow. sense. Fantastic, Ed. 
Fantastic. So, Julio, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Professor. I mean, a pleasure to, to listen to you here. Um, my question is uh, simple. Uh, when uh, one understands uh, your concept of uh, the new smart, uh, in some way, you start looking for people qualified, let's say, as a new smart to interact. Uh, it's not easy, you know, for people to leave ego on the side not easy to be humble uh at least this is what's happening uh with me here right you try to try to find the new tribe let's say so uh, in that sense uh, it's a personal question to you i mean have you have you also adjusted your circle of uh, people and friends you you interact uh it, it's uh you know it, it's hard uh, when you go to, when you understand the concept. And I, I mean, and organizations are full of uh, the th theatrical way, you know, the political side of it. It's, it's really tricky. So you're trying to find outside of the organizations, you know, the, the new smarts, or you try to pro promote that in your organizations. But the question is on your personal side, have you switched, you know, to a new tribe and a new circle of friends? Um. That's an interesting question. I never have been asked that question. Let me think for a second. Let me go to the new smart for a, a moment. Uh, I think that new smart in an organization, really for it to be, to work has got to come from the top down. And I mean, if the CEO doesn't buy into the, you know, the new smart principles and start role modeling, it won't happen, all right? And so my experience has been um, that is it possible for people that are in small teams or people that are in a different division, can you have your own sort of, quote, new smart culture where you work? Uh, the answer is that's worked for some people and then for some people it hasn't worked, but it is possible. Uh, have a, has, has the new smart or my way of being has it does it influence who you know have i basically kicked some people off my list of um, um no i i haven't i haven't directly kicked anybody off the list but they basically fall off of their own account all right i mean it's um it's it's sort of like you don't you don't you don't have to kick them off um, in the sense that, um, you know, the conversations are not that much fun or the this or the that, or they start feeling like, okay, I'm not doing this or I could be better and everything. And they, you know, instead of saying, let's, let's have lunch every two weeks, it goes, let's, oh, why don't we make change it to once a month? And then, you know, why don't we change it to once every six weeks? And that's what, you know, how people basically try nicely to just say, you know, you I don't, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't have time to do this. I don't believe in this. So whatever the answer is, um, but it generally doesn't. It it comes about my experience, and I'm only one person. I haven't. I don't believe I've ever intentionally dropped anybody off the list, but I've had lots of people on the list basically fade away. So they were being nice without trying to tell me I was a dork by fading away. Great, very thank good. you. Yes, thank you very much for, for opening up um, so, so deeply. And if, if I may, I'm gonna ask very, a very, very personal question based on a sentence that you mentioned before. Um, by the way, I loved your book. Um, I work now at Google, so it, it really made me think a lot of things, but I work in the Latin American team. Um, so you said that um, you always went into the unknown uh, without fear. Yeah. And my question is, was it really without fear or did you simply disregard or um, uh, 
pretended it was not there? And if so, you know, when did you realize that? Um, and how did you deal with it? Because um, from my personal experience, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this. And uh, I think it's hard once you realize, which was my case, once I realized that fear was there, I wasn't looking. Um, it is hard to overcome. So I just wanted to ask about that. Well, I, my, my answer is probably one that is not helpful uh, or maybe I'll leave it, leave it at that in a sense that it goes, it goes back to second grade in uh, elementary school um, um, in being put in situations and going into situations and learning things that I knew nothing about and all the way through, through you know, like what happened with my football coach to then when I go to, you know, to the university on a scholarship uh, because of him. And then when I'm in the university, um, you know, I get a, although I wasn't an athlete, I get a full athletic scholarship. To, and then I have one of the, you know, coaches say, you know, we'd like you to build a, a, a data system for us. And this was before anybody had a data system in college athletics. And I said, I don't know how to build a data system. And they say, we know that, but we know that you know how to learn. Go build a data system. So then I spent, you know, one and a half years building a data system for a big college football team that ended up having the three biggest college football coaches in the United States come and copy the system. But I just went and did it. And I've, and it probably shows how crazy I am that I never was fearful of, of uh, going into the unknown because I felt like, I don't know what I felt like. I felt like not that I could, could do it because I didn't know what the heck I was even doing. So I had to start off and find out what is the, what, you know, who do I talk to? And then, so since I always love reading, you know, oh. and then I never, I never was for whatever, just like when, you know, I went to law school, I picked up the phone and called the Dean. I never was basically scared of no. I was just, let's go see. I mean, and, and if I'm not wrong, you wrote to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader asking her to celebrate your wedding. Isn't it true? Yes. And she did it, right? Yes, yes, she did it. She became a family, family friend, a great, great woman. But yes, I, uh, I did that. And so I just, you know, it's, it's like, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm, so you can't, I can't help you vis-a-vis. -vis, and I'm not saying that you're doing anything wrong because what you're doing is natural. Okay. It happens to a lot of very smart people like you are. For some reason for me, because of going back to age six or seven, I was told to go, you know, um, go, ex go figure it out, go explore. And nobody ever beat me up when I didn't come back with the right answer or an answer. So it's sort of like genetic. <laughs> Well, it's behavioral, right? And 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 it doesn't it doesn't mean that you didn't have the fear, but that you dared, right? You had the the courage to dare, and and I think I think that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh, Ed, uh, as I said before, being able to call you friend has been one of the greatest gifts of this program for me. It's always a pleasure, and I'm sure for everyone here who had the privilege of being uh, during this session. And uh, well, we just would like to deeply thank you once again for your incredible generosity since our first exchange many years ago, you know, of taking your time to be with us. It's been very, very, very important for us. We uh, practice gratitude with uh, many 
uh, human beings and you are one of them, you know, just please know that uh, you are in our thoughts always, our gratitude thoughts. So it was a memorable occasion for everyone. And um, of course, uh, we always uh, expect to um, and hope to be able to, to have another session like this in the future, at some point in the future with you. It's always an occasion for us that it's um, not only of learning, but also of life in its fullest sense. We go um, out of this session with a lot of uh, inspiration to go on and to believe that we are on the right path, you know? It's not a linear path, uh, it's not easy, but uh, I, I really feel that we are doing something right when we have sessions like this one with you. So thank you, thank you, Ed. And Angel, if you'd thank like you. to thank him. Thank you. thank you so much, Ed. It was fantastic once again. It's uplifting and we see in practice what humility is so <laughs> it, there is no hypocrisy here uh so it really means a lot to us thank you so much thank you so much uh, physical thank applause <laughs> to, to Ed. No, 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 no. thank you, thank very much. Thank thank you, you so very much. much thank you for um, uh, being allowing me to be with you and for your patience with me and everything and i wish you all the best on your journey all the best on your journey and uh thank you thank you thank you so much thank ed bye-bye bye-bye see bye -bye. you